that will tribunal hold the law. This is second class of the esoteric antecedents of the Lima course. And we are talking about one of the great figures, not only of the Renaissance, but of so-called Western esotericism entirely. And that of course is Pico della Mirandola. Um, his full name was Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. And um, he's a kind of minor, he's a, me he's a member of the nobility. So his territory is maybe not the most important state, but he's one of the, he's, he's among the princes of the peninsula. Um, and so he is one of the great exemplars of what you call humanism. And we didn't really have time to talk so much about that last time. So this time I want to talk more about, about humanism. So what's important about humanism is, is that it, it really represents, um, it represents the, a kind of form of cultural learning. Let me put it this way. In ancient times, they had a concept of what was called um, the paideia. And this was a system of education that um, members of the uh, property class, the patricians were all part of. And it involved particularly skill in rhetoric and how to make speeches, particularly political speeches, um, usually some kind of form of philosophy, uh, but it was particularly focused on learning good either Greek or Latin. And What's important about that is, is that the paideia forms a common cultural matrix that everybody is participating in. So no matter what part of the Roman Empire you're in, you can show up somewhere and the, the, the property classes there are going to be able to communicate with you in not only a common language, but a common intellectual culture. And so that breaks down at the end of the Roman Empire. And then there's several periodic attempts regionally and more generally within the culture of Latin Christendom to revive that mode of learning, to, to revive that um, tradition of a kind of paideia or a kind of common cultural heritage. And it's particularly focused on being able to read and write good Latin or Greek. Um, so there's, beyond the medieval revivals, the revival of this that's going on in the Renaissance is particularly important because um, Cicero is a major figure. Um, someone named Erasmus produces kind of a definitive Greek with textual apparatus edition of the New Testament that becomes very influential. Martin Luther, for example, uses this in some of his own um, theological work. Um, this is kind of the addition that all the, all the reformers are using in their own reinterpretation of the, of the Bible. Um, but a little bit before that in the primary Renaissance itself, um, what's important about humanism and particularly the way this gets preserved in a complicated way in the later Catholic culture of Southern Europe is that it offers an alternative to um, the very soon to emerge anti-intellectualism that um, is an important feature of Protestant spirituality. Um, and it becomes particularly dominant in something you might call Puritan culture which is especially, um, especially prevalent in the United States. And so um, the kind of cultural paradigm that eventually wins out in Northern Western Europe in the uh, Protestant states there, and then it spreads through colonialism to the rest of the world. And it, this eventually becomes the kind of liberal bourgeois culture of most of um, our current space of globalized capitalist media culture, which the United States and the American empire, the, the main player in this, um, were the main exporters of culture. So the culture that 
wins out in the state that eventually colonizes or is at least colonially dominant in North America um, over the coming centuries results in what becomes a kind of anti-intellectualist um, agenda, kind of ideology in the United States. And this particularly is infused in popular spirituality. And that's why in a lot of neo-paganism, including in Thelema, but particularly I think in a lot of forms of witchcraft, there's a kind of um, bias against rationality or philosophy. If you're engaging in philosophical speculation or rationalism um, towards, you know, magical practice, theurgy, the, the theory that goes along with this, uh, this type of practice, um, you're accused of making a, almost a kind of category error that um, by being quote unquote too intellectual, you're somehow not being quote unquote spiritual. And this um, takes you what takes what you have to say out of consideration. And I think that so many people who have this attitude, and I think we've all encountered many, many people who have this attitude, uh, who accept it as a kind of given, um, almost to the point that it's not, it's, it, it's presumed to be so true that it's not itself subject to debate or um, reevaluation uh, as, a, as an assumption, that they think this is some kind of like common sense notion that they're just coming up with is, as a independent individual. And they don't realize that it's not them who's having this idea. It's John Calvin who's having this idea. It's Martin Luther who's having this idea. And that, that that's the cult, that's the that's the historical background of a, of a particular type of actually very specifically Protestant um, theology that they're actually um, articulating. Um, and so as somebody who um, is part of and an advocate for the continued reemergence of a kind of um, um, neo-pagan, um, you could almost call it pagan secular kind of um, almost that the, the, the culture of modernity more and more is becoming a kind of pagan secular techno-gnosticism as the, as the kind of uh, um, consensus position for um, how, how you experience um, the, the, the world about you at the level of a kind of popular spirituality or popular, um, popular culture. Uh, and Christianity as such continues to lose ground in that context and become more and more reactionary um, in its response. And so that's why I think it's very important to be alert for ways in which there's the kind of persistence of a type of Protestant Puritanism, which I think is ideologically toxic, to be frank, that's my opinion. Um, and the way that this continues to um, persist and insist within um, the emerging mainstream form of the, the, the neo-paganism that forms a background to so many people's magical practice, particularly if they're Thelemites. Um, and so while it's in a way reassuring to um, see the kind of larger cultural paradigm that we're part of went out, so to speak, um, and become more and more dominant, at the same time, um, there's difficulties that emerge where a lot of assumptions from the previously reigning Christian colonial imperialist um, paradigm and all of the particularly social prejudices that go along with that, the way these continue to persist and insist, uh, and then people who might otherwise be open to a bigger worldview get caught up in a lot of these ideas and they keep getting repeated. Um, magical Renaissance humanism is a kind of antidote to that. Um, and it's really the, because it's, it's the real predecessor of both our own magical tradition. Um, and it's a very intellectually positive paradigm. Um, and in fact, the great manifesto of this is the oration on the dignity of man, which we're going to be looking at in a little bit. Um, but I think also what's important about 
Renaissance Hermeticism is that it really represents a fully alternative paradigm to the Reformation itself. That in a way there's, 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 I don't want to even call Hermeticism its own Reformation. I would say it's more of a revolution. Um, the Reformation, on the other hand, is a, in many ways, basically conservative attempt to try to get back to the Christianity of Paul of the first century before the Constantinian um, adoption of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire made Christianity the official state religion. And by no means are the um, by no means are the reformers opposed to Christianity being a state religion. Um, quite the contrary, in fact. Um, but they're opposed to it in the form that it had taken in the Middle Ages that became medieval Catholic Christianity because um, it um, takes on a form that they, they wanted to get back to the earlier, what they imagined to be the pure form of the gospel. Um, so hence, what Luther does is he has this doctrine called solo scriptura, only the scripture as the criterion for uh, interpreting the truth. Um, so even though Luther is himself in many ways a humanist, um, meaning he's a scholar of biblical languages, um, he can read the Bible in um, both Greek and Hebrew, um, but he becomes a kind of anti-humanist because he's, he doesn't want to be theologically outmaneuvered by somebody bringing in some kind of philosophical argument that he can't address just from the biblical text. So he creates a spiritual paradigm that's still very dominant that um, you're not supposed to look at philosophy when you're doing spirituality. These are, these are antagonistic things. And what's important about humanism in both the Catholic and now this emerging, um, um, I would even call Pacino and Pico almost crypto pagans in a way, um, but that's not uncommon in Italy at this time that there's so much cultural interest in the paganism of antiquity um, in its um, art and learning that um, Although it's um, officially Catholic, this is very much interfused with um, a kind of um, already a kind of modern neo pagan culture that's already trying to emerge. Now, the Spanish conquest of the peninsula and the imposition of the Counter Reformation is going to kind of partially crush that and suppress it again. But Again, it's this kind of neo-pagan element of modernity itself, I think, in a way. There, there's an argument to be made that modernity itself is a kind of Gnosticism, a kind of reemergence of Gnosticism. Um, and therefore, that modernity itself is in some sense pagan. Um, I mean that in a pluralistic sense, not in some kind of religiously reductive um, sense. And um, so, for example, Peter Gay, in his history of the Enlightenment, talks about the emergence of a what what he calls a kind of modern paganism, uh, which he actually equates with Enlightenment and with modernity. Um, that these are all cognate. So, with Ficino and Pico, we're having really the first fully integrated, self-aware emergence of this kind of um, cultural paradigm that, in a way, is what we're participating in, and. Um, when I say it's an alternative to the Reformation, what I mean is, is that if this had won out, instead of what Luther and Calvin wind up doing, or Ignatius Loyola and the Spanish emperors and the Counter-Reformation and then the wars of religion, and then everybody's exterminating each other based on confessional differences, and it just it goes on and on for like a century. Um, there's a civil war in France between the, the Huguenot 
Calvinists and the, the, the Catholics and the nobles take different sides and they go to war with each other. It was a civil war for like 50 years in France and France almost goes Protestant, but the nobles who are being supported um, by the Catholic cause, they, they kind of by historical contingency, they, they eventually went out. And so France stays officially Catholic. I say officially because as in Italy, there's already, there's a kind of um, crypto-pagan secularism that's already creeping in at the level of popular culture that all of this religious fanaticism is in a way, it has its virulence precisely because it's aware that they're already in the 1500s, already in the 1400s, losing the cultural war to more interesting alternatives than Christian fundamentalism. And of course, that, that issue only magnifies. That's only going to continue. Uh, and Christianity is just going to continue to lose ground uh, in its orthodox form. So um, Martin Luther had 95 theses that in 1517 he hammers up on the door of the church, right, and starts the, starts the Reformation. Well, a number of years earlier in 1486, Pico had 900 theses that he published and announced that he was going to have a debate on these in Florence. And they were about how um, Plato and Aristotle's philosophy could be reconciled. And um, basically by interpreting them in terms of a kind of hermetic theurgy. And um, this type of Neoplatonic spirituality that was Christian basically in name only um, would then be the basis for the reconciliation of all you know, classical learning with um, the highest possibilities of human culture and art and in a sense of the Renaissance itself. And um, um, the, the ideal is gonna be that the, the human being is the new locus of the divine, that um, the, the, the human person in its divine uh, dignity it, as, as artist, as philosopher, um, as sage, is, uh, the, high, is the, the highest realization of the divine ideal, that, that such a human person basically is a god not just as like a God, but is a God because their soul is infused with the form of the divine as Hermes Trismegistus teaches. Um, I think that's fascinating because I find this magical philosophy which continue, it gets suppressed, but it continues in an underground form is basically the, the message of the hermetic gnosis that uh, I find this very difficult to distinguish in any meaningful way from Thelema. That th this is the this is the basic idea. It's already here in the Renaissance, and uh, this is basically our tradition. And then it gets um, immediately. There's criticism. Um, Pico was born in 1463, so he's 23 years old when he makes this announcement that he's going to debate the theological faculty in. Florence, which is the, the, the seat of learning in, uh, I mean, Venice is like the mercantile center, uh, but Florence is the place where all the intellectuals, it's the place where Leonardo da Vinci's there, uh, Dante, uh, uh, a little bit earlier, um, was from Florence. Um, the dialect of Italian, which is you could say uh, the, the modernized version of Latin that they're still speaking on the Italian peninsula, the, the dialect of that that's spoken in Florence becomes what's today modern Italian um, because that's the language Dante wrote, the, the, the dialect of Italian that, that Dante um, wrote the Divine Comedy in. Um, and so that becomes the, the modern Italian language in the similar way that of all the dialects that are going on in the German speaking Holy Roman Empire, um, the type of German that 
Martin Luther, when he translates the German version of the, makes a German version of the Bible, that that then becomes high German. So the, the Florence is so much the center of learning in, in Italy that the, um, their dialect is itself the, is itself the, then what, what, what modern Italian becomes. So anyway, Pico in 1486, he announces he's gonna have this debate with these 900 theses. Um, they don't let him do it. It's too audacious. Um, they're, they're not gonna, the, there's this outcry from the Cardinals that this is uh, uh, too precocious to, to do this. So um, Pico then in the next year, 1487, uh, he publishes the Oration on the Dignity of Man, which was intended to be the introduction, introductory speech of the debate. But he revises it and then um, publishes it. And there's also an apology that he writes. Um, officially, he retracts the theses he's made to do that, but it's under the understanding that he won't be prosecuted. So he's off the hook, but he's still kind of under a ban. And then he, um, the controversy is significant enough that he winds up going to France for a while. So he's in exile for a while, but then um, he's brought back to Italy. But then in 1492, remember our important year, 1492, discovery of the new world, expulsion of the Jews from Spain, and also um, a certain member of the Borgia family by the name of, uh, the title rather I should say of Alexander VI becomes Pope. And um, you might remember that he's on the saints list in the Gnostic mass. Okay, why is he on the saints list? He's on the saints list because in 1493, he exonerates Pico della Mirandola. And he, um, basically issues a papal decree in, in the form of a long letter that's, that's published in which he says that um, Pico's this great sage and um, everything's cool and this is all, all of this doctrine is okay with the church. And it turns out to be very important. <laughs> Pico, by the way, passes away at the somewhat young age of 31 the, the next year. There's rumor of poisoning, but there's always rumor of poisoning when somebody dies in Italy because it's so common that people are poisoned, or maybe it's just common that the rumor is that they're poisoned because the political culture there is into backstabbing. Um, they don't have modern medicine. People get sick and they die suddenly. It's something that happens. Uh, whenever that happens, there's going to be a rumor that there was foul play if there was any controversy associated with the person in question. So uh, was there foul play when Pico died? We don't know. Um, anyway, he passed away in 1494. Um, and then, of course, the Italian peninsula is invaded by the Spanish and the Renaissance kind of comes to a halt. And all this stuff goes underground, but it's been approved by the church by papal decree uh, through this weird backhand. This weird thing happens, and it's like it can't be like completely suppressed because there's this papal decree saying it's okay. So it has it stays on the books. It doesn't get um, it doesn't get censored officially. And so this is important because it means that hermeticism stays in the game, as it were. Um, so obviously, it's a, it, this is why I say that it's, it's kind of the first counterculture. Um, so it's not going to be the primary paradigm <laughs> um, during this period. That's going to be the, the counter-reformation in the, the, uh, the Catholic alliance. And um, now there is a lot of religious experimentation, what you could call the radical reformation that, that goes on during this period coming up. Um, and humanism 
plays a significant part in that in the emergence of what could be called the radical enlightenment. Um, and there's a number of kind of, I think it would be wrong to call them like free thought um, figures because there really isn't such a thing at this time. Um, everybody assumes there needs to be some kind of censorship. Um, the idea that you wouldn't censor stuff is just not the way that people think politically at this time. And so when you're, you're reading stuff from this time, you kind of have to accept that that's just, um, just the way that things are. Um, Francois Rabelais is the figure that's really important for the Thelemic tradition um, because the, the, the word Thelema itself is kind of a, a reference to Rabelais' novel, Gargantua, which is published in 1534. And this is the Penguin edition with its sequel, Pantagruel. And um, it's an early novel and it's kind of in the form of a fable. Um, the point about this is, is that um, because of the these earlier figures like Pico and so forth, when you get to a little bit later with Rabelais, um, there's a continuation of a criticism within the humanist tradition. There's, there's the continuation of a criticism of the type of religious extremism that's going on as the religious wars are breaking out at this time. What that means is, is that um, Gargantua and Pantagruel are a kind of um, satire of religious bigotry. And the ideal is of the hardy, learned person, not unlike um, Pico's ideal of the sage, um, sort of the sage Bagus. And um, this is a person who has uh, embraces the joys of life and is not um, ascetic or too pious minded. Um, so anyway, this, this is described at the end of Gargantua when um, after a series of adventures to commemorate all the hijinks that have gone on during the novel, um, Gargantua has a abbey built. He, he endows a monastery. And this is going to be the, it's called the Abbey of Thelema. And um, he just, after a description of all the fancy building that they build for it, there's then a description of the rule of life at the Abbey of Thelema. And this is the description. It says regarding the inhabitants of the, um, the residents of the Abbey. All their life was regulated not by laws, statutes, or rules, but according to their free will and pleasure. They rose from bed when they pleased and drank, ate, worked, and slept when the fancy seized them. Nobody woke them. Nobody compelled them either to eat or to drink or to do anything else, whatever. So it was that Gargantua had established it. In their rules, there was only one clause. Do what you will, because people who are free, well-born, well-bred, and easy and honest company have a natural spur and instinct which drives them to virtuous deeds and deflects them from vice, and this they call honor. Okay, so this is the Thelemic ideal, um, and this is why do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law is, in fact, a paraphrase in a way. It's a kind of quotation from from Rabelais and from this humanism, this um, tradition of, um, I, I wouldn't exactly call Rabelais a magician, but he's, he's part of a humanist tradition that's very interested in natural magic, that's interested in uh, the, type of, the type of lore that um, Pico and Pacino are, are focusing on the magical parts. Uh, Agrippa, uh, Cornelius Agrippa was a contemporary of Rabelais. Uh, in fact, there's kind of a parody of, of Agrippa in this, uh, in Pantagruel. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to turn and take a look at 
the actual manuscript itself of, let me find it here. disappeared. Let me find it. Here we go. All right. So I've got this blown up a little bit. So Henry and Maria, um, Henry, if you could read this first paragraph for us. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry on the left side there. Yeah, uh, no problem. Most venerable fathers, I have read in the records of the Arabians that Abdul the Saracen on being asked what thing on as to speak the world stage he viewed as most greatly worthy of wonder answer that he viewed nothing more wonderful than man. And Mercury's a great wonder, Asclepius, is man. So Mercury is, of course, Hermes Trismegistus. Mm -hmm. It's Mercurius. Keep going. On thinking over the reason for these sayings, I was not satisfied by the many assertions made by many men concerning the outstandingness of human nature, that man is the messenger between creatures familiar with the upper and king of the lower, by the sharp-sightedness of the senses, by the hunting power of reason, by the light of intelligence, the interpreter of nature, the part in between the standstill of eternity and the flow of time, and as the Persians say, the bond tying the world together, nay, the nuptial bond, and according to David, a little lower than the angels. These reasons are great, but not the chief ones. That is, they are not reasons for a lawful claim to the highest wonder as to a prerogative. Why should we not wonder more at the angels themselves and at the very blessed heavenly choirs? Okay, Maria, if you could keep reading. I don't think we can hear you. It doesn't. <clears throat> okay, um, Taryn, you go ahead and read this um, the second paragraph then. Sure. Uh, finally, it seemed to me that I understood why man is the animal that is most happy. It is therefore worthy of all wonder. And lastly, what the state is that allow that it that is allotted to man in the succession of things, and that is capable of arousing envy not only in the brutes but also in the stars and even in minds beyond the world it is wonderful and beyond belief for this is the reason why man is rightly said and thought to be for a great marvel and the animal really worthy of wonder now hear what it is fathers and with kindly ears and for the sake of your humanity give me your close attention Okay, and then in this next paragraph, which I'm going to sort of paraphrase, um, God is described as the master builder and also as the, as the great artisan. Um, and basically the metaphor here is that he, 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 the universe is like a temple, and then the human being is going to be set within that temple as like they're the God of that, of that, of that temple. So that the universe itself is kind of like a magical, magical temple within which the human being is able to, to do their works of works of power, as if they're seated on their throne inside of their, um, their temple. Um, this is um, kind of a common, um, common metaphor. But uh, what's interesting about this is that he, um, God is not the lawgiver. God is not the, um, uh, like the engineer like he is for Newton, where it's like he's the God is the clockmaker, right? Instead, God is the artist. Okay, now this is this is clearly a Renaissance ideal of of the divine, um, and that's interesting because um, if 
human beings are then, according to this kind of traditional Christian theological notion, in the image of God, then however the, th the, the particular thinker using this metaphor is describing God, that's also going to apply to the divinity of human beings or our own quality of divinity. So if God is the great artisan, the great artist, the great creator, then that's going to be what's preeminent for human beings as well. So this is this is all a kind of um, um, and this this is kind of also Friedrich Nietzsche's reading of um, these type of Renaissance um, thinkers. Um, this is all this is a philosophy of a kind of creative self making. So through the power of their creative imagination and through their their learning and their self acculturation, um, human beings are able to um, make themselves into, into divine beings, that the, their artistry is towards themselves and their own culture. Um, so that's why it's so interesting that he talks about God as the artisan. Um, so then what happens is that um, God's made the human person. He's made Adam, the, the, the first human being. And then he has a speech that he gives to, to Adam. And this is, of course, a very common trope in these kind of this kind of rhetoric, which is that the um, you have some deity or some hero appear that embodies the particular ideal that your essay is about, and then you have them give a speech, <laughs> and that 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 becomes your kind of your thesis statement. So, um, uh, Henry, if you want to read, starting we have given to thee Adam. Uh, this is. Um, God is going to describe to Adam why they're so special. It spoke to him as follows. We have given to thee, Adam, no fixed seat, no form of thy very own, no gift peculiarly thine that thou mayest feel as thine own, have as thine own, possess as thine own the seat, the form, the gifts which thou thyself shalt desire. The limited nature in other creatures is confined within the laws written down written by down us. by for us in conformity with thy free judgment in whose hands i have placed thee thou art confined by no bounds and thou wilt fix limits of nature for thyself i have placed thee at the center of the world that from there thou mayest more conveniently look around and see whatsoever is in the world neither heavenly nor earthly neither mortal nor immortal have we made thee Thou, like a judge appointed for being honorable, art the molder and maker of thyself. Thou mayest sculpt thyself into whatever shape thou dost prefer. Thou canst grow downward into the lower natures which are brutes. Thou canst grow upward from thy soul's reason into the higher natures which are divine. Okay, there we go. That's the speech. So um, now this is interesting because what makes human beings distinctive, we have a kind of uh, our divine quality, it's our freedom. It's our creative freedom to make ourselves and our culture and our history into, we're, we're the makers of ourselves. Now, this is really modern. This, this, is a, this, is the, this is the big modern breakthrough right here in philosophy. Um, and I think what's, a, you know, it's, it's Jean-Paul Sartre might as well be, be writing this um, or any of the later, um, any of the later existentialists. Uh, and th this is sort of the core of modern humanism right here as well. Um, man the maker, a uh, homo favor, um, like in Marx where human beings make their own history and are themselves then made by that history. Um, and of course, if that's going on, then God is a separate being, you don't actually need that anymore. Uh, and so that can either, um, as in deism, there was a God that created the universe, but they're no longer around. Or um, the divine is now a kind of mystical or philosophical um, kind of ground of being that um, human beings are united with. Um, so you could describe that maybe as a kind of pantheism or um, traditional God talk just kind of ceases and goes away as in, um, more norm, more contemporary forms of um, of atheism, um, and you can then, of course, reintroduce polytheism into that, where the um, 
the whatever pantheon you're working for are kind of um, signs or signifiers, rhetorical tropes for the different themes that you're treating, which are then energized in your imagination, like in William Blake. Um, so you see, we, we have a fundamental break here with the medieval medieval worldview, and yet um, it's all magical. It's all it's all theurgic um, in this text. It's um, it's it's itself a kind of spirituality, um, and so there's there's nothing about this that disenchants the world or human life or human beings. Um, quite the contrary. This is a primary reenchantment of of our dignity as human beings. Um, that we are the locus of will to power, as Nietzsche would say, that can make meaning in this way. Um, and so, um, the usual kind of conservative reactionary Christian complaint about um, this type of this type of humanism is, is that, oh, by um, not obeying God or not believing in this higher transhuman power that you have to, that, that, that makes the rules and then you have to obey that. Um, you're, you're taking away meaning in the world. You're, you're leaving us bereft of, the, of absolute values and then we're all adrift and it's terrible. And um, as, um, I think Dostoevsky puts it, um, if God doesn't exist, then everything is um, permissible. And um, and he thinks that's bad, by the way. Um, so uh, he, he's, an, our, Dostoevsky is an articulator of the, the, the sort of um, alienation of modern life, but um, um, he, he himself is a kind of cynical theist. Um, who, who thinks that human beings are degrading themselves this way. Um, so, but the point I'm making is that, and this is the point that Pico is also making, is that he's wrong. Um, it's, it's great that human beings aren't subject to being the slaves of some external power. We shouldn't be slaves, we should be free. Human freedom should be the basis of our dignity and our creative um, making of ourselves and our world. And this is what I'm claiming Alistair Crowley calls magic. That's the, the process of this. And that's what's being articulated here in this text. Um, what I wanna do now is show you, um, Pico now develops this in, let me see if this is gonna show up. Can everybody see where it says system of Kabbalistic correspondences? Is that on your screen? I'm still seeing the text. Okay, let me switch it here, just a moment. Oops, hang on. Oops. Okay, here we go. Now can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. So um, there's some Kabbalistic correspondences that uh, Pico's now going to use um, to show the different, um, there's the three levels of the soul. And these are the three Kabbalistic parts of the soul. Now, he doesn't use the words Neshama, Ruach, and Nefesh, but he's definitely alluding to those. Um, and ex it, the explicitly Kabbalistic versions of these, uh, because there's something else that Pico is introducing this text that's going to be super influential. And it's not just this humanist ideal of human beings as the locus of the divine. But in addition to the natural magic that's part of um, the Hermetica, he's going to combine the Hermetica with um, something that he's a kind of Gentile who's rediscovering, and it's, it's Jewish Kabbalah. And He's, because he's learned Hebrew and he's studied with some Jewish scholars and um, he's discovered that there's all this magical stuff that's been preserved um, in the Jewish Kabbalah. Um, a lot of it's coming from um, 
Platonism, which is, of course, also what's influencing the Hermetica. And so there's a kind of synergy because of that between these two systems, because they're, in a way, doing the same. They're doing the same thing. They're, they're drawing on a kind of common genealogy. And so Pico's kind of re, rediscovering that this is the case. And so that um, these two otherwise, in some ways, different systems. And we'll, we'll talk later when we get to talking about the Sefer Yetzirah in a future class. I'll have more to say about how Kabbalah is also different from um, Greek Hermetic magic. But um, Today, for this class, it's, it's enough to run with Pico and look at the ways in which it's similar. So you've got the three, um, the three different souls, right? Neshama, Ruach, Nefesh. Uh, what Pico is going to call the intellectual, the rational, and then the um, emotional or instinctive parts of the soul. Now, this might be a little bit confusing because um, isn't intellectual and rational the same, or we, we would in contemporary English tend to use these two words interchangeably. Um, intellect and reason in common English usage, at least currently, are, are um, uh, synonyms. But for, for Pico's usage, uh, when he says intellectual, he means like the realm of the forms. So this is not just um, ordered rational thinking, but is the form of that very thought. Um, so it's kind of the next higher spiritual level up. Um, so there's these three choirs of angels, the seraphs, the cherubs, and the thrones. And he corresponds to these three levels. There's these three different kinds of angels that are set uh, that correspond to these, these three parts of the, the soul. And then each of these has a different, like, um, theological virtue, right? So there's charity for the seraphs, um, intelligence, uh, reasoning for the, the, the cherubs, and then uh, judgment or discrimination, and these particularly moral discrimination for the thrones. And these also relate to the three subjects of moral philosophy, natural philosophy, to which he links natural magic, and then what he calls theology, but what he really means by theology is theurgy. And um, although he doesn't use these elemental correspondences explicitly, I think that he, by implication, that um, he's thinking of the three mother letters in the Sefer Yetzirah, and that these are these three parts are meant to correspond to the elements of fire, air, and water. Um, and although he again he doesn't actually say that in the text, but um, I think that this would be a reasonable um, and obvious correspondence. So now I'm going to switch over to. Um, back to the text that we were looking at, and we're going to read, um, so he's asking, what are we supposed to do to make the divine ascent and divinize ourselves? So Taryn, if you could start reading where it says, by what, but by what method? But by what method or by doing what? Let us see that they are what they are doing, what life they are living. If we too live that life, for we can, we shall equal their lot. The so seraph, they are the angelic hierarchies. The seraph burns with the fire of charity. The cherub shines with the radiance of intelligence. The throne stands in steadfast, steadfastness of judgment. Hence, if dedicated to an active life, we undertake the care of lower things with a right weighed weighing of them. We shall be made steadfast in the fixed firmness of the thrones. If being tired of actions and meditating on the workman in the work, on the work in the workman, we are busy with the leisure of contemplation. We shall flash on every side with cherubic light. If by charity we with this devouring fire burn for the workmen alone, we shall suddenly burst into flame in the likeness of a seraph. Upon the throne, that is, upon the just judge, sits God, the judge of That's the... That's good. Go ahead and stop there. Um, okay, so you see, here's the three different choirs of angels. And then what's going to happen is there's going to be a divine ascent. So he's going to use, of course, the um, example of Jacob's ladder from Genesis. So um, 
Henry, if you could start reading where it says, and lest our Christians be insufficient for us, meaning he means the New Testament. And lest our Christians be insufficient for us, let us consult the patriarch Jacob, whose image flashes forth carven in the seed of glory. That very wise father will give us advice by showing himself asleep in the lower world and awake in the upper. But his advice will be given figuratively. That is the way all things happen there. A ladder stretching from the lowness of the earth to the heights of heaven and divided by the succession of many steps with the Lord sitting at the top, the angels contemplating climb by turns up and down the steps. But if we who are in pursuit of an angelic life must try to do this same thing, I ask, who can touch the ladder of the Lord with dirty feet or unwashed hands? As the mysteries put it, it is sacrilegious for the impure to touch that which is pure. But what are these feet and what are these hands? Naturally, the feet of the soul are that most despicable portion which alone rests upon matter as upon the earth. So I mean, that's the, the nephesh. That's the, the instinctive soul. I mean, the nutritive and the food-taking power, kindling wood of lust and teacher of voluptuous softness. As for the hands of the soul, we might as well have spoken of anger which struggles as a defender for appetite and like a robber under the dust and sunshine carries off the things which will be squandered by the appetite, which is dozing away in the shade. So that's the emotion. So you've got the appetites and the emotions. They're both parts of the, the, the nephesh. But so as to not be hurled back from the ladder as profane and unclean, let us wash these hands and these feet in moral philosophy as in living water. That is the whole sensual part wherein the allurement of the body resides, the allurement from which they say the soul gets a twisted neck while being held back. But if we want to be the companions of the angels moving up and down Jacob's ladder, this will not be enough unless we have first been well trained and well taught to move forward duly from rung to rung, never to turn aside from the main direction of the ladder and to make sallies up and down. When we have attained that by means of the speaking or reasoning art. Okay, then... so this is natural philosophy or dialectic, which is linked to natural magic. And so now this is the ruach or the middle part of the soul. Then be sold by a cherub's spirit, philosophizing along the rungs of the ladder of nature and penetrating through everything from center to center. We shall at one time be descending, tearing apart like Osiris, the one into many by a titanic force. And we shall at another time be ascending and gathering into one the many, like the members of Osiris, by an Apollonian force, until finally we come to rest in the bosom of the Father who is at the top of the ladder and are consumed by a theological happiness. Okay, so that's the divine union that is the theology, but it's really the theurgic union with the divine, uh, which is our own nature at the top of the ladder, according to the metaphor. So that's the selfs at the top, right? That's the, who then energize the, the shama, the whole, and then you, you rise up to that through the ruach, and that's the caribs. Uh, and then you've used moral philosophy in relationship to the thrones to, to, to get yourself in order so that you can make the ascent. So you see, it's all the metaphor of the three, three different parts of the soul. And he says it's an Apollonian force because Apollo is, the, is a god who delivers oracles and visions. Right, he's he powers the oracle at Delphi. Right, it, they they worship Apollo there. Right, so he's he's making reference to this visionary power of the imagination uh, to energize this this divine Platonic ascent through these angelic levels. And then, of course, he has the fun metaphor with um, with Osiris, right? Because um, that's this Egyptian theurgic example, and of course, that's also used in Thelema, right? Because um, the dismemberment and reassembly of Osiris is celebrated in the um, mysteries of the um, uh, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, where they have the different elements on the altar, right? And this is done in Pyramidos too, right? Where you have the, um, the, the feast or Eucharist of the four elements, which are the, the parts of Osiris that have been separated for analysis, but are then recombined. So you've got all the theurgic rites here that are then, um, that are this kind of hermetic Kabbalism that are then being recombined um, with basically the, the, the major metaphor or image of traditional Christian medieval mysticism, which is the ascent of Jacob's ladder. So it's, it's all been synthesized 
here in this text. Um, I think this is great stuff. Um, okay, so let me show you a little bit about the archangels here. It's on page 17. There's some stuff on the next few pages about the ancient mysteries, Pythagoras, Chaldean oracles. We can go back and look at that if you want to. But I just want to show you, um, here he says at the top of page 17, and if it is right to make public even enigmatically something um, from more hidden mysteries, after the sudden fall of man from heaven has condemned our heads to dizziness, and according to Jeremiah, death has entered through the windows and stricken liver and breast, let us call Raphael, the heavenly physician, to free us by morals and dialectics as by saving medicines. When we are restored to good health, oh, so that's the nefesh being, being healed. And then Gabriel is for the Ruach. When we are restored to good health, Gabriel, the strength of God, will now dwell in us, leading us through the wonders of nature. See, that's natural philosophy. And pointing out the virtue and power of God everywhere through natural magic, he will finally hand us over to the high priest, Michael, who's the sylphs with the neshama, who will distinguish the veterans in the service of philosophy with the priesthood of theology, as with a crown of precious stones. So again, it's the same, it's the it's the same threefold um, system of correspondences. And here he's got the three archangels, and you could also add the element of earth or the body for Uriel if you want to have the full four. But again, it's 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 uh, he's even got the the archangels that get used in the vanishing ritual of the pentagram. They're in this text too. See, it's all it's all here. Um, he also has this. Um, Good remark here at the bottom of page 17, um, where he refers to what he says is this destructive and monstrous opinion that no one or few should philosophize has much invaded the minds of almost everybody, as if it were absolutely nothing to have the causes of things, the ways of nature, the reason of the universe, the counsels of God, the mysteries of heaven and earth, very certain before our eyes and hands, unless someone could derive some benefit from it or require profit for himself. So he's concerned with the way that already there's a kind of um, utilitarian impulse with a kind of leveling impulse with already the early form of modernity that's starting to happen in um, the Renaissance, where everything's just being seen in terms of its use, its commercial usefulness, rather than um, how it makes us wise, how it conduces to our, how it conduces to our dignity. Um, I want to say a little bit more before I open to questions about the introduction of Kabbalah um, in this text. So there's some interesting stuff on page 26 through 29 on natural magic, which we can get back to, but I want to go forward to page 29. Um, 29 through 31, he introduces the idea of Kabbalah, um, where he says he's brought forward something from the ancient mysteries, um, and, but he, he gives kind of his own opinion on page 32, where he talks about his own experience with it, and he says, he's, he tracked down these Hebrew books and was able to communicate with um, Hebrew sages. And he says, this is on the left side of the page here. When I had procured myself these books at no small expense and had read them through with the greatest diligence and unwearied labor, I saw in them, God is my witness, a religion not so much mosaic as Christian. There's the mystery of the Trinity. There the incarnation of the word. There the divinity of the Messiah. There I read the same things on original sin, on Christ's atonement for it, on the heavenly Jerusalem, on the fall of demons, on the orders of angels, on purgatory, on the punishments of hell, which we daily read in Paul and Dionysius. That's the um, uh, pseudo Dionysus, actually, in Jerome and Augustine. In those matters that regard philosophy, you may really hear Pythagoras and Plato whose doctrines are so akin to Christian faith that our Augustine gives great thanks to God that the books of the Platonists came into his hands. In short, there is hardly any dispute between us and the Hebrews on this, where they cannot be so disproved and refuted from the books of the Kabbalists that there is no corner left in which they may hide. I have Antonius 
Chronicus, a most learned man, as a most trustworthy witness to this. When I was at his house at a banquet, he heard with his own ears Dactylus the Hebrew, who was learned in this science, come down on his feet and hands to the exact belief of Christians on the Trinity, or anyway, so it's interpreted by Pico. Um, why I want to point out this passage is that I think it's, it's easy to misinterpret what he's saying here. Um, I want to be clear that all, all any Christian um, would, would talk this way at that time. And um, this should not be considered an anti-Semitic statement because it's not racialized. That for um, people in the Renaissance and earlier, Jews are not a race. They're a heresy. Judaism is a heresy. It's not a, it's not a race or um, ethnicity thought of in the in the later in the later sense of that. Um, in fact, Pico is actually extremely philo Judeo. Um, he's very supportive of the study of Hebrew and of um, he's really one of the first to really pay positive, serious attention to uh, Jewish literature within a Gentile context. So he initiates a whole fad of interest in Kabbalah by Gentile writers. Um, so in 1517, by coincidence, this is the same year as Luther's 95 Theses, uh, Johannes Reuchlin is going to publish a book, De Art Kabbalistica, um, which is a major source for um, basically the, the tradition of um, Kabbalistic magic that the, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is, is eventually part of that, and also therefore also the, the Thelemic tradition. Um, this is sometimes, I think, correctly differentiated from um, explicitly Jewish Kabbalah, meaning Kabbalah occurring within the um, Jewish, explicitly Jewish confessional uh, community. Um, but it's a mistake also to see it as too radically separate. And in fact, there's often a number of moments of hybridity where um, it's not just Gentiles who are doing so-called Christian Kabbalah, and they're not all particularly Christian necessarily either. Um, to give just one example, um, in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn itself, um, the Kabbalistic researches that McGregor Mathers is involved in are, of course, collaborated in by his wife, Moina, um, May Bergson, and the, her brother is Henri Bergson, the Nobel Prize winning philosopher. And of course, the Bergsons are French Jews. So um, Moina Mathers is, of course, a Jewish participant in the development of the kind of Kabbalah in Kabbalistic magic that's going on in the, the Golden Dawn. So it's not, um, it, it has this kind of liminal quality where it's, it's overlapping also with um, um, Kabbalists who are also Jewish as well as Kabbalists who aren't. So um, it's, it's a complicated picture. And so um, it requires a certain degree of nuance to uh, tease out exactly the way to uh, read statements like this in Pico that um, basically he's not going to be allowed to talk about Kabbalah at all unless he presents himself as endorsing the point of view that, of course, Christian faith is the truth and Judaism is a kind of um, uh, reprobate position. Um, and this is despite, and uh, this is despite the fact that um, he's, of course, very impressed by and impressed by Kabbalah and has a very positive opinion of it, and in fact is um, an important figure in bringing that into the, the, the conversation as um, the type of neo-pagan um, hermetic magic that's now emerging as a kind of underground paradigm that's eventually going to turn into Thelema is getting underway. And um, this is a, always a synthetic position that is a kind of conversation occurring uh, between all kinds of different interwoven threads, whether that's alchemy, Rosicrucianism, um, 
Greco-Roman theurgy, and of course, as a very important partner in that conversation, Jewish Kabbalah. So all of these together get interwoven um, to produce the cultural paradigm, the cultural underground that then Thelema is going to eventually emerge from. Okay, so um, I've gone over a lot of the stuff in this text. There's, there's more to talk about, and there's always more to talk about, uh, about either people or this text. I would like to pause and let me unshare my screen and open up to questions um, that anyone here has. Maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion um, about this text and figure how it relates to Thelema. Um, yes, Henry, go ahead. Hey. Uh, so yeah, uh, you talked of, of several times about modernity, uh, and in particular, you you talked about modernity seen as like a, a gnostic resurgence. I was wondering if you could talk about you know what you mean by that a little bit more specifically in terms of you know relating the, the those two definitions together. Sure. Well, there's when I say that it, it's a kind of gnosticism. I'm referring to modern science as a kind of knowledge about the world that then gives us power over it and that is then the focus of our cultural practical concern and activity. Um, as opposed to the experience for most people most of the time in traditional societies, which is that um, you're on a farm and you're being um, piously religious about rites and rituals that order your life seasonally around um, whatever particular pantheon is mythologically um, your culture. Um, and these are fundamentally different experiences. And that relates to the other thing that makes modernity different from traditional societies, which is that, and here I'm gonna follow a kind of um, historical materialist interpretation from uh, Marxist historicism, which is that um, cultures can be defined or theorized in terms of the underlying economic conditions that produce that culture. And so what makes modernity distinct from earlier cultures is industrialized, eventually industrialized um, commercial capitalism as the basis for culture, as opposed to um, agrarian feudalism, which is based on controlling land so you can then get um, rent or a tithe from that land. And so power is determined by which feudal uh, gangster um, politically controls more land that they can get their money from, the, the people who live on that land by taxing them. And so that's where power in society derives. And then once the great mercantile, um, uh, the, the procedure of industrialized capitalism is an earlier form of capitalism called mercantilism. That's what's already emerging in the, um, uh, in the Renaissance, which with the kind of merchant empire that Venice has and allows for the kind of wealth in Italy that allows for the intellectual culture to, to be there. Um, and, that, and as colonialism begins with the discovery of the new world, that's going to expand globally. And um, when that happens, um, wealth is determined by capital investment in merchant corporations. So for example, the British East India Company basically owns India. So um, all commercial activity, um, the owners of the stock owners of that company in England or Scotland or Wales, or, you know, the, the, the wealthy bourgeois uh, owners of stock in the East India Company, they're um, making more money than like almost anybody else in history off of basically um, commercially plundering this entire subcontinent. But I mean, that, that's what's going on with all of the, the, these emergent new type of mercantile capitalism. And so it means that the nobility lose power and that the owners of capital become the ruling class. And this creates a new social experience where um, the subjectivity of being like a small property owner, own your own house or shop or something like that, or you're privately wealthy, so you're, you're you're a quote unquote gentleman. You don't have to work in the fields or in a factory. Um, that the subjectivity of that particular private individual now becomes what it means to be a person. So it's the, it's the basic, and of course, this is then the viewpoint that's then in novels that then begin to emerge at this time. Um, 
And so, um, whereas prior to that, the, um, the, um, the main character in fiction is the knight, is the um, noble who goes out and has adventures. Um, and that's a very different type of, uh, of character. Um, but then there's a different kind of character in modernity who's then the main subject. And so what I see is going on in a text like the oration on the dignity of man is, is that there's an attempt already to create a kind of um, magical paradigm for this new emerging type of subjectivity, which is not yet what we could call the bourgeois subject, but it is already the private intellectual in a way that is already kind of different from what was going on, what was going on before. Um, if the great ideal for Machiavelli's The Prince was one of the Borgia princes, he's probably Cesare Borgia. Um, for Pico and Pacino, it's um, magician sages like themselves, not necessary, necessarily politicians. See, Machiavelli is still looking back to the medieval ideal of the knight, um, who's the uh, gentleman in court, and um, you know is is the is the person of culture. Uh, but so, in a way, the prince is still kind of looking backwards, whereas um, Machiavelli is hoping that one of these princes will emerge and unite the Italian states so that they'll be able to have a kind of um, national cultural identity that will prevent them from being overrun by the already stronger national states of Spain and France and England that are already emerging at this time. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. They don't get it together and they get overrun by the Spanish Empire. So they get, um, they're, they're not, they're prevented really from developing their own um, independent national uh, culture as quote unquote Italians really until the 19th century. So, because they keep getting conquered and overrun and controlled by some somebody else, um, you know whether that's Napoleon or whoever comes in and they they get dominated by some other country. So, um, for Machiavelli, he's thinking, well, there needs to be some strong prince who's stronger than the other princes who can um, cleverly outmaneuver them and gain power, and then he'll be this wonderful noble that we can all give our kind of fealty to. And, uh, but Pacino and Pico, their ideal is the, is the magus. Their ideal is the magician who combines everything good about culture and learning in their uh, creative intellectualism. Um, Francis Yates, author of uh, Giordano Bruno, the Hermetic Tradition, um, she speculates as to what the operative form of the magia that Pico is talking about would have been for him. Um, we know that um, Pacino had um, orations, spells that he would say, sometimes set to music. These would be translations of the Orphic hymns or other. Uh, and he also used uh, talismans. And he also used dialectic, meaning he would uh, study philosophy with others and have a kind of argument and back and forth to try to puzzle it out, um, kind of what we're doing now in a way, um, and, but that he treated that as a magical philosophical activity. It's its own kind of theurgy, um, as it was, I think, also for Plato, by the way. Um, and then the, the, it's, it's its own kind of intellectual divine ascent as you're ascending through the philosophical argument, uh, and you can kind of come to an epiphany at the end of the dialogue. Anyway, that was the ideal. Um, so, but um, Yates speculates that uh, Pico's operative method was his imagination. And she speculates that in the context of the um, extremely wonderful art that's being created in Italy at this time, remember he's in Florence? Well, that's the Florence of Michelangelo. That's the Florence of Leonardo da Vinci. That's the there's all this painting and sculpture and stuff that's going on. So she speculates that he's having these imaginative um, um, 
visionary experiences where uh, on the basis of similar to the kind of art of there'd be these artistic frescoes of the angels that he would use those mosaics to sort of have that occur in his head as it were so that he could ascend through art basically to uh, an imaginative contemplation of these angelic orders. Um, so again, it's very much related to the whole art culture of the Renaissance, which is then inseparable from this kind of um, magical worldview. It's um, really this wonderful thing that's going on in the Renaissance, which is why it's so regrettable that it gets um, uh, the religious wars come in in the next century. And it's like, by the time you get to the 30s war, years war in um, the Holy Roman Empire, all the different European powers are sending armies in there and 40% of the population, uh, they exterminate each other uh, based on confessional differences because the German states can't make up their minds whether they're Protestant or Catholic. And so they all split up based on which princes uh, ally themselves to which alliance. And then the armies come in from outside to support these different sides against each other and they slaughter each other for 30 years. It just goes on and on and on. Um, there's this wonderful Michael Moorcock novel, The War Horse and the World's Pain, that's about this particular period. Uh, wonderful little magical uh, novel, by the way. Um, and, uh, but I mean, Christianity is just awful during this period. And yet already there's this kind of, um, crypto-pagan magical underground that's fighting back. And that's what I think is really um, really intriguing. Uh, anyway, um, Maria or Taryn, do you have anything you wanted to ask or add? Um, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying, that distinction of you know Pico's uh, cultural contextualization for, you know, uh, uh, his remarks not being necessarily anti-Semitic. And, and yet I think it's also still what we can look at now in a modern context as being sort of culturally appropriative um, on the basis of, what would you call that? Like a logical or argumentative fallacy. I mean, he's he's almost sort of begging the question in this sense of, of presupposing the context of Judaism like as you said like as a as a heresy yes um of Christianity sort of already presupposes this kind of like uh, uh connection for things so he's gonna he's gonna see those he's gonna see the things that he wants to see yes and it. if he says anything other than what he says in that paragraph he'll be prosecuted that he wouldn't be able to publish this essay at all I mean mm -hmm. literally it would be illegal for him mm -hmm. as a baptized Christian to be seen to be publicly advocating, oh, hey, you know, this is cool enough that maybe you might want to convert to it or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Which there are some enthusiasts um, who get interested in the Kabbalah, you know, in this period who, again, they don't say that, but they, they, they're they um, interested enough in it as an alternative to Catholicism or whatever they're doing that they're, uh, they wind up for all intents and purposes doing that. Um, so, for example, when Reuchlin comes out with his book, he explicitly says uh, he's more hostile to Judaism than Pico is. Um, he takes the position that the reason he's um, pausing the sort of Christian interpretation of Kabbalah is that this is explicitly for the purpose of converting Jews. Um, we, Pico doesn't go that far. Um, but Reuchlin does, and there's good reason to think that he believed that. Um, certainly many people at the time did. Um, and so it became this, so for example, Raymond Lull, who is referenced actually in the um, oration, um, because the way it manipulates different kind of logic systems through a kind of numerology, um, Pico sees as, um, he in, interprets Kabbalah as being something like that, or there, there's certain relations between something that's called the art of memory and the Renaissance. And um, people who are involved in that get interested in the Kabbalah because of its metonymic tendency to um, um, play these kinds of um, language games with um, the way it interprets the, the, the scripture. Um, meaning it, it uh, it's not only allegorical, but it's also, it doesn't use straightforward metaphor. It uses this kind of metonymy. Anything you can do to kind of, you can, um, remove the vowels and read the, 
it different differently depending if you substitute different vowels or you could um, substitute letters or diff do different almost kind of acrostics with the with the text. Um, and um, so Raymond Lull, his um, art of combination, um, he um, explicitly, he's Castilian, I think, he explicitly developed that because he thought it would allow him to convert, he would be able to prove Christian doctrine with it and convert Muslims and Jews to Christianity. So this is kind of like, this is a scheme that people at this time use as a, as a reason to justify why they're investigating this material that's that's considered heretically suspect. So yes, it's appropriative. And this is the only way you're gonna be able to get it into the, di the dialogue at this time is to appropriate it this way. So- Right, right, it's, right. Uh, it's kind of a devil, it's kind of a dialectic. It's, it's like you, you, you kind of have to take the bad with the good to have it be there at all. Um, it's kind of the, the, the way history worked at that moment. Right. And I, I, I'm just sort of curious, though, about how you then um, advise the modern reader to, again, get what it is that we're getting out of it, uh, while sidestepping, falling into uh, uh, perhaps an intended or unintentional trap of then being... Um, uh, appropriative at best and and falling into anti-semitic tropes unconsciously at worst, sure. at worst. Uh, the secret trick which is not such a secret trick is to read as much primary jewish stuff as possible uh, gershom sholem in particular uh read everything by him and there's there's piles of um uh, books written by jews to popularize or or just works of scholarship uh, on the subject of um uh kabbalah often written for, with the intention of um, uh, Gentile readers being able to um, engage with the material. Aria Kaplan, I think, has a lot of good stuff in particular. Um, the whole branch of, um, uh, what was it called? Not, not Reform Judaism, it was called, um, the Kaplan was in charge of, it was it's slipping away from me now. There was like a whole kind of movement around him uh, at one point. Um, uh, Daniel Matt is another great writer. Um, he's just completed the first complete, really good, good translation uh, into English uh, as the editor uh, of the Zohar, for example, uh, with the, the fullest possible kind of uh, apparatus to go with that. And that really corrects a, a gap in terms of that material being available uh, in a really scholarly edition in the, in the English language. So I've got all the volumes of that. Um, that's worth going, that's worth flipping through. Um, the area Kaplan right, edition the, of this. What was the yeah, name? Yeah, go ahead, Henry. Sorry, what was the name of the Zohar translator? Uh, the editor is Daniel Matt, spelled M-A-A-T. Um, if you put that in an Amazon or Google, it'll come up. Um, there was a foundation that put up the money to publish this multi-volume edition of the Zohar. It's definitely worth a look. Uh, the area Kaplan translation and commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah probably the best version in English to start with. Um, and anything by Gershom Sholem, I particularly recommend Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, which is actually kind of the book that repopularized Kabbalah in a Jewish context uh, in kind of modern times after the war. And um, uh, Kabbalah was not considered particularly respectable by uh, Enlightenment Jews, particularly um, bourgeois German culture Jews, um, because that was something that they did in the sticks in Poland. It was kind of something that Hicks were doing, but but it got rehabilitated significantly after the war, particularly by Gershon Scholem's work. Um, all of that's worth looking at. Um, major trends in Jewish mysticism begins on the first page with Scholem disparaging that there's, there's this popular writer on Kabbalah by the name of Aleister Crowley that everybody's reading instead of the Jewish stuff. And if they would please put him down and take a look at some of the, the actual Jewish material that would, he'd really appreciate that. That's on page one. It is <laughs> right in the footnote. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, but it also means he's aware that some of his Jewish readers are reading Crowley or Kabbalah and he's upset about that. <laughs> Anyway, 
Um, so th this is all stuff to, to look at. And um, the antidote to appropriation is just to, to read good stuff and get up on the scholarship and then, then you're understanding it and then you're not appropriating it. Um, but of course, you know, that requires us to get the bar up uh, in terms of the, the, the level of engagement with, um, you know, the abundant materials that are available in Jewish studies, which of course involves both Gentile and Jewish scholars uh, who research this material and, uh, and take a look at it. And it's, it's easy to be part of that conversation. You just have to read some books. Um, so anyway, that is my answer to that, that question. And we'll have more to say about, uh, again, um, the way that the Jewish tradition in particular offers some alternative hermeneutical ways to interpret esotericism that aren't part of the Greek metaphysical tradition. So there's some differences as well as similarities. And we'll have more to say about that when we actually look at the Sefer Yetzirah later in this, um, later in this course. Um, in the meantime, we're kind of drawing towards 3.30. So I just wanna, if anybody else has any questions or comments before we close. No, okay, great. So next week, we're gonna look at the Platonic theology of Albinus. Um, this is a kind of a short textbook of Platonism and it allows us to go back to ancient times but not have to actually directly look at Plato which would be a little bit too complicated for this class that would have to be its own course. Um, so instead I picked out this middle Plat uh, Platonist textbook on Platonism, which I think is pretty neat. Um, I've included all of it. There's no reason to read all of it. Just kind of glance through it. If you have some time, I'm gonna cover all the stuff that's important um, just like we did with the oration today when we get to that. Um, okay, that's um, that's next week. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, love is the law, love under will. Everybody have a nice week, okay?